uh, the next question is rather broad, moving down to the specific. Everybody has an interest here in conservation, and everybody is starting at a different level of understanding. We know that education is the first step into making a difference. But how do you, more specifically, how, how do you go about coming up with a plan or figuring out how to make a difference? Where can, where can they start? Jim, would you like to start with that? Well, uh, I would say you need to find out who are the local conservation leaders in your area. In some cases, it's going to be the official Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries or the Virginia Department of Marine Resources, depending on where you live. In some cases, it's going to be a non-governmental organization like the National Wildlife Federation. Ed and I were on their board for a long time. If you have a particular sportsman's bent and you're particularly interested in federal policy, you could go to the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership website and see the kind of things we're working on. There are many, many organizations. Local Audubon, if you're a bird watcher and you're not in tune with local Audubon, you're probably missing a bet in terms of finding out what the issues are and what some of the status and trends of populations are. So the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service usually has regional and local offices. You can go to your local fish and wildlife refuge and find out if they have a friends group take some tours. There are many, many men, many government and non-governmental organizations who care about conservation, both at the local level all the way up to the international level. So I would simply say, get busy, find your sources, find out the kind of conservation work you like the most, and, and get active. Some of us like to work on policy, and we don't mind writing to our elected officials. Others of us like to make wood duck nest boxes. Some of us like to take scouts out to the local refuge. Some of us like to work with the local duck club so that we have songbirds as well as ducks at the marsh. There are many, many ways to get involved. Some of us just like to write checks and check the website and see if they're doing good things with my money. But every one of us should be doing what we can because conservation in America is at a crossroads. And it won't take the right crossroad without all of us being involved. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll just pick right up on that. And, and I think the, the question is, how can I make a difference? I, I feel, uh, rhetorically speaking, I feel like I'm just one person. One person can't make a difference. One person can't matter. Um, I, somebody earlier, uh, some of our colleagues here, brought me a little plaque. And the, the sign on that plaque is, uh, beware of uh, a group of dysfunctional people working in groups or, or something to that effect and it was just hyster hysterical and but also uh, very very relevant people who care can make a difference i mean that's just all that matters that that you begin to care about something and then decide what is what kind of difference do you want to make is it are you wanting to share information are you wanting to affect public policy are you wanting to be a hands-on difference maker. Uh, certainly through places like the garden here, being able to come work as a volunteer, uh, places like Center for Conservation Biology, I know they use some volunteers, but at the Wildlife Center we use volunteers from all over the state to help us transport animals. These are people who don't have time to get involved on a daily basis, but once in a while when the phone rings and they know there's a need, they can drop what they're doing and, and put a bird like an eagle in a car and drive it up to the Wildlife Center. The, the real thing that we strongly encourage people to do is pick something to care about, then learn about it, and learn about what's affecting it, and then find people to trust to tell you what you need to know. Uh, there, there's an awful lot of misinformation out there, and I, I'm sad to say, having spent 35 years in the conservation and environmental movement, that a lot of the conservation organizations that started off as passionate advocates have become corporate bureaucracies and they have lost themselves in the business of staying in business. And they won't work together at the corporate level when those of us out here on the ground, we don't care what your policy is or what your beliefs are or what your religion is. If you care about the issue about which I care, you're my friend. And that's the way it needs to be. But in terms of uh, individual action, decide what you care about and then learn about it. That's the, that's the big thing, and identify people you trust and ask for 
pressure points because you can sign all the online petitions in the world and you'll never make a difference in the world. Uh, I'm very cynical about those because I've been in this field for 35 years. Uh, we used to do paper petitions. Every politician that runs for elected office has to get a petition with names on it so they can get on the ballot. And many times those politicians get more names on their ballot petition than they do votes in the voting box. So they know just how deep the commitment is on a petition signing and that's like zero. They just don't pay attention to it. A letter, a real paper letter with a real stamp on it anymore is the most powerful way other than face to face to communicate with an elected official. But make time, get involved, tell people what you care about. Tell the people you hire with your votes and your tax dollars to act on your behalf, be it agency personnel, be it elected officials. Tell them what you care about, tell them why, and tell them you're watching. I can tell you, you watching the Wildlife Center in Virginia are eyes that are felt, and I have no doubt whatsoever that you watching others will be uh, equally effective. Thank you. I think the best example of people getting involved is right here. Look at who's seated next to you or who's standing next to you. When this, uh, when the Eagles decided to move here in December of 2003 and finally come to realize uh, later the next uh, winter that the Eagles were here to stay, decisions had to be made about what do we do about that. Um, this was new, this urban developing population of Eagles uh, where they were beginning to move into our neighborhoods. And the regulations at that time were much stricter than they are today uh, and had to have been followed to the letter of the law, uh, essentially the garden would have been turned down. I mean, it would have been closed. You wouldn't have had access to it. But fortunately, the people making the decisions realized that there was an opportunity to involve the public, to help educate the public. And two major parts of the uh, effort on the part of the Center of Conservation Biology was an opportunity to learn for ourselves because this aspect of the eagles moving into our neighborhoods was new to us. Uh, we don't have very much knowledge. We didn't have very much experience. And this was an opportunity for us to learn. At the same time, we realized that there was some opportunity to educate the public, uh, to get them involved. We had no clue. We had no idea that it would develop to the point that it has today or that we'd be holding an Eagle Fest here at the Norfolk Botanical Garden, which is, by the way, a botanical garden. One of the comments that uh, early on that Don Buma, the executive director here, made to me is first time he'd ever seen people walking around the garden with binoculars. You don't need binoculars to look at flowers, but you do need binoculars to look at birds and eagles. Uh, you have made an impact. Uh, other places like this, at Decora, the Eagle Cam there, uh, and other locations have had similar experiences. Uh, Jim was talking about how the Eagle Fest in Klamath Falls, where he's from in Oregon, has developed from a very local to an international event. Uh, and that's certainly here. I've met people here today from England and and uh, other locations, people who've traveled here from California, Illinois, Indiana, Pennsylvania, to come to the Eagle Fest here, and it's because you care. If you didn't care, you wouldn't be here. So a big part of the thank you to not only your moral support, but your financial support has been uh, part of the success uh, here, and will continue to be. Thank you. Thank you. What we're gonna do now is, um I have a portable microphone, so I can come out to you. If you have some questions, we'll open it up to you for some questions. Anybody? Yeah, so I'm just wondering if you can address the status of this nest here and who we should send letters to to um, you know, express our opinion on this. <laughs> Everybody's looking at me because they know that I'm the one that's uh, probably, I can run this way. The question was, and I'm sure you heard it, but to give a little context, 
uh, it has it kind of become public information that uh, the the nest here has been identified as a potential threat to well all right then beep beep back at you uh, has been identified as a potential threat to aircraft we've been hearing airplanes landing right behind us every time one lands or take off takes off I can see the tail and read the tail numbers right through the trees right here behind us we're a few hundred yards away from a, an international airport and a busy runway. The U.S. Department of Agriculture's Wildlife Services has been charged with the responsibility to go nationwide at all of the airports in the United States and identify places where birds presented a risk to aircraft, and most of the time it's Canada geese and seagulls, but not always, and to identify those places where a threat exists, where a true risk exists, and to identify potential solutions or mitigation steps that could help reduce that risk. So that's the context. This nest has been identified as a potential risk, and it is legitimately so because at least two eagles from that nest have been killed by aircraft. And to have a 14-pound bird smash into the windshield of an airplane as it's taking off or landing could have absolutely catastrophic effects. Now, is that the biggest risk facing aircraft there? Is that as big as seagulls or Canada geese? I don't know. I'm not the I'm not the expert on that, but I think uh, in my opinion on this is that we need to keep it in context, to keep our opinion within the context of reality and Brian's program and in Reese's program and uh, uh, Libby's the presentation was made about eagles moving all the time, naturally, anyway. If lightning strikes that tree and that tree goes down, that nest is going to move. That's nature. If it blows over and the nest goes down, that pair is going to move. Well, the pair, let's see if Dad can ever make up his mind. But, uh, and we all mourn in our own way. He's just picking a, a more enjoyable way to mourn. But the, the fact is that we need to keep in mind that the process that is at work deals with all airports, all birds, all risks. It's not personal. And as we respond to it, we need to keep in mind that our response needs to be within an understanding that our enjoyment, our investment, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. And so that's, that's the question. And I'd like to just add a little bit. You know, from a, from a broader context, we are in a fight to save conservation here. And saving conservation is going to be determined by how well we win the hearts and minds of the voters, not all of whom are eagle advocates, but generally people who do care about wildlife. The problem is they care about a lot of other things in their life too, and they're balanced in a busy life. The last thing we want is for a media story to be what's more important, people or eagles. And we really don't care if 500 people die. We want to preserve our eagle nest, which is right in our backyard, because we got a cam on them. So what you got to do is you got to back up a step and say, how will we explain the working out of this balancing policy to a million people in the media as we work through a deliberate process? I guarantee you the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries is looking at this very carefully, but it's primarily a federal decision will primarily be implemented through the federal process in this broad context. What I would encourage everybody who cares about these particular eagles and this particular nest to think about is how do you work out a solution to this problem that makes sense to an a, a million average people who are going to read about it in the paper that doesn't make eagle advocates look like they don't care about people and they don't care about human safety. There's a big example here of how we work together balancing conservation, healthy communities, human safety, priorities for budget. And this controversy is embedded in a much larger question and we're fighting to win the hearts and minds of people who are busy, who are voters, who are going to decide where we head for conservation in general. We don't want to send a message that it's all about me, it's all about us, it's all about my eagle, and I really don't care if a plane goes down. That's the counterproductive message. You don't want to ever send that message. Uh, 
uh, correct just one thing that uh, Ed said, only one eagle out of this nest has been hit. Uh, the other eagle he's referring to is actually at a nest on the other side of the airport before they got here, just to set the record straight. Uh, to answer the question, uh, quite frankly, we don't know what the answer is at this point in time. Uh, it appears that the uh, folks involved in making the decisions do realize that the issue is not just the eagles and not just here. Uh, the overall issue is the airport and the Norfolk Botanical Garden sit right in the middle of a large bird feeder, Lake Whitehurst, uh, surrounded on three sides. And it's not just eagles, but many other species that depend on the life that lives in this area and in Lake Whitehurst. So it's, it's a big issue and it's a big question. It doesn't have a simple answer. And for sure, it's not going to make everybody happy, no matter what the answer is. But certainly the point that Jim makes about the uh, issue of eagles versus people is not the controversy that we want to be caught up in, nor is it the position that we want to find ourselves taking.